commencer. Euh, qu'on est très heureux d'accueillir Jane Humphreys. Alors, euh, quelques mots euh, pour euh, la présenter. Euh, Jane est professeure euh, émérite euh, d'histoire économique hein, à l'Université d'Oxford et elle est euh, Centennial Chair à la London School of Economics. Hein. Euh, pour résumer en quelques mots ces, son, ces, ces travaux qui sont très nombreux et, et dans, qui ont été faits dans différents, menés dans différentes directions, donc bon, ces thèmes de recherche euh, tournent autour de l'histoire économique et sociale, euh, le, le, le travail en particulier, les, le, le marché du travail, le travail pendant la révolution industrielle, euh, le travail des femmes, euh, les relations entre euh, la famille et l'économie, euh, les questions de euh, l'économie du genre. Euh, Jane a publié plusieurs articles euh, fondateurs, euh, classiques maintenant, euh, parfois seul, parfois avec, euh, avec d'autres euh, historiennes ou historiens, euh, qui, des articles qui ont beaucoup aidé à... Euh, euh, réévaluer la contribution des femmes et des enfants à la révolution industrielle euh, en Grande-Bretagne, sur euh, laquelle elle travaille depuis euh, 30 ans. Euh, par, alors, parmi, ces, parmi ces travaux, euh, il y a ce livre qui est paru en 2010, qui s'intitule « Childhood and Child Labor in the British Industrial Revolution », paru chez Cambridge, et c'est un livre qui euh, étudiait le travail des enfants, euh, mais en s'appuyant moins sur euh, les archives, euh, sur les, papiers, les rapports parlementaires, sur les, sur les, les, les enquêtes euh, menées par, par différents... Euh, il y a quelqu'un qui parle. Est-ce que, s'il vous plaît, vous pouvez couper les micros Merci. Euh, donc, ça s'appuyait moins sur des, des sources classiques de l'histoire du travail des enfants qui sont constituées par euh, notamment ces grandes enquêtes euh, parlementaires euh, menées à l'époque victorienne que sur euh, des autobiographies. Des, elle avait utilisé euh, plus de 600 autobiographies. Euh, voilà, donc... Hein, un corpus euh, important euh, euh, qu'elle avait déployé, mobilisé pour construire une base de données sur euh, l'expérience du travail euh, qui était ensuite analysée de façon systématique euh, à partir de ces, de ces récits de vie. Quoi. Et euh, parmi les apports de cette euh, recherche, il y avait euh, l'idée que le travail des enfants euh, n'a pas été marginal pendant la révolution industrielle. Euh, euh, il n'a pas seulement été un complément euh, euh, du travail des adultes euh, les, les revenus apportés par les enfants n'ont pas, des, des, pas seulement complété ceux des, ceux des parents euh, cette, euh, ce travail a beaucoup augmenté euh, pendant euh, la période couverte, il a été massif puisque les enfants euh, si je me souviens bien d'après son étude euh, représentaient entre un tiers et, et, et deux tiers des, 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 des travailleurs dans les, dans les fabriques textiles euh, peut-être un quart dans les mines et puis euh, le travail des enfants a beaucoup contribué à l'essor de l'industrie, à l'augmentation de la richesse produite en Grande-Bretagne. Alors, dans le livre de 2010, Jane étudiait les enfants dans leur globalité, avec beaucoup de, beaucoup de différenciations par tranche d'âge, mais disons que là, depuis, elle s'est intéressée à la part spécifique, à la place spécifique des, des filles. Est -ce que, qu est -ce que, quelle a été la place des filles dans la révolution industrielle et pour ça elle a élargi son corpus à d'autres sources dont elle va parler aujourd'hui certaines enquêtes des, des récits de vie qui n'ont pas forcément été écrits par les, par les ouvriers eux-mêmes mais parfois par d'autres pour donc une, une étude de cette place des, des filles des petites filles souvent dans la révolution industrielle. Donc, on va l'écouter pendant euh, trois quarts d'heure avant une discussion. Euh, je voulais dire, to, 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 to finish this introduction, Jane, I wanted to say that we're very uh, uh, happy and 
honored to, to welcome you. Although we're very sorry we can't uh, meet you for face to face in Paris, but uh, this is the way oh. we live now. <laughs> yes. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, listening to your uh, presentation and then having a discussion with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me, Fabrice. And uh, I'm very happy to meet you all, albeit in this rather strange and um, disembodied way. Um, as um, Fabrice knows, this is um, work which I started some years ago and got interrupted by a whole series of um, studies of um, a boring topic of wages. Um, but I came fed up with wages. I came back to um, my work on um, girls during industrialization in Britain. Well, let me begin with two experiences then. Elizabeth Andrews, who was leaving school age 13 in the 1890s, contemplated um, the opportunities for girls in her local Welsh um, labor market. And they were the brickworks or the colliery screens, as we see here um, on this side of the, the picture of girls working on the surface of a coal mine. Um, and she confessed herself terrified at the thought of working in either environment. And a um, hundred years earlier, and the same age, Marianne Ashford had also rejected what she described as the half-starved life as a dressmaker's apprentice in favor of domestic service. And this is a, an also a Monday photograph um, of a domestic servant. The intervening hundred years between these two girls looking at the labor market um, represented enormous economic and social changes in Britain. The Industrial Revolution essentially happened. Um, and there's been much research into the Industrial Revolution itself and into even women's experiences of it, but we know very little about girls. Most studies of use following the sources, apprenticeship records, wage data, and so on, have focused on boys or young men. So we really need to know more about girls and their experience of industrialization. Were they involved alongside boys in the child labor market of the Industrial Revolution era? Was this also, as it was in the case of boys, at the expense of schooling? How did their families structure the supply side of this labor market? How did their position in the family and expectations about their future gender roles affect their experience? There's a big gap in the literature here. As I said, most studies focus on boys or young men, and yet it is possible to do some comparisons. We know that um, boys had uh, more access to apprenticeships and their wages were more likely to rise with age. Um, was this, how does this really relate to girls' experience? And although there's a gap in the literature, there's a very interesting suggestion by Mary Jo Mays and her co-authors in a 2005 book where they, they hypothesized that given girls' presence in some of the um, early industrial workplaces, that girls actually played a very key distinctive role in Europe's path to industrial development. So we really need to think about girls' experience and gender um, the experience of children, um, not lump them together in a lazy kind of way. And uh, working people's own accounts of their lives provide a way into some of these questions. And I used working class autobiography in, in my book with CUP um, uh, two th in 2010 to look at the experience of children located in their families and communities, um, their experiences of work, of earning, of schooling, of apprenticeship and training, and their experiences of family life. I extracted material from 617 working class autobiographies, and I analyzed this 
evidence, both quantitatively and qualitatively. It's a mixed method story. And I have to say, this was controversial at the time. My editor was very unsure about this, my editor at CUP. Uh, and um, other people have argued um, that the source is not really appropriate for quantitative analysis. But I will defend this mixed methods um, quite vastly, you push me. And I've done so in the paper um, that this presentation is drawing upon. But one weakness of my work was that it was only the writings of men. It was 617 working class autobiographies written by men. And although women and girls feature in these life accounts, they do so as mothers, wives, sisters, sweethearts, um, and um, they're addressed through the male gaze. And this led to um, criticism and some interesting work mm -hmm. followed up, which mm -hmm. I relate mm -hmm. to that um, initial research. So Ginger Frost, um, an, an American uh, social historian who's written very extensively on children in the late 19th century and on, um, she's a legal historian, she works on illegitimacy, um, and um, family breakdown. But she argued that my finding that mothers really were the linchpins of working class childhood, that that um, was, was colored by the fact that I had only used male writings. And she argued that if I had actually included women's reminiscences, they, they would have been much less likely to have uh, felt so warm disposed to their mothers. Um, and there's been follow-up work that has also used um, working class life accounts. And let me draw your attention to a lovely book by Julie Mary Strange, um, which is a rehabilitation of working class fathers, um, which um, she, she, she kind of, she wants to, uh, rehabilitate um, the, the kind of distant, grumpy, um, often um, unresponsive fathers that I at least partially subscribe to in my work. Um, and there's also been recent work by Emma Griffin um, in the American Historical Review, where she actually talks about the emotional and material neglect by mothers, which also um, nuances um, the account that I presented. So in the current paper, I look at the life stories of 227 working class women and using the same quantitative and qualitative joint methods. Um, let me um, give you a taste of some of the findings here. Um, we're going to find similarities with the male experience. They similar family structures, fathers are the economic mainstays of these families, but children saw their fathers through gendered lenses and that's going to be quite important. There's the same dip in the age at starting work associated with industrialization. Um, and that then you could say that girls experiences run parallel to boys as far as the early industrial labor market is concerned. But there are also significant differences from the male experience. Girls have less education throughout the time period until mid-century, and they have much narrower job opportunities. But I also found, and this is um, testimony to the importance of close attention to the texts here, that Girls express constant fear of sexual predation, which is completely absent in the men's reminiscences of their childhood. And um, there's also um, a recognition of the stress and risk of maternity, which colors the way in which girls look at both their mothers and fathers. And what I'm going to argue is that this also leads to alliances and alignments within families 
which are really quite important historically. All right, the structure of my talk is I'll spend a few minutes on the sources, and then I'll talk about family life. Then I'll talk about the age of starting work in comparison of girls and boys and schooling duration and experience. And then I'll finally come back to these gendered reflections on family life. Sources then first. Well, British working class life writing is an unusually rich resource. Um, although Mary Jo Mays again has uncovered some German and some French life stories from the same time period. And my student Fanny Louvier, who Fabrice kindly um, examined her PhD, she has looked at French and, 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 and British um, life stories by um, domestic servants for a slightly later time period, but in a very illuminating and interesting way. The, um, evidence for Britain has been usefully annotated and summarized um, in the 1980s, as early as the 1980s, by Burnett, Vincent, and Mayall, who also did very early pioneering work on this source. And Burnett connect, collected a lot of this material, which is now archived at Brunel, which was his university, and is now digitized. It was not digitized when I did my work. So this is making it um, much more accessible and much more um, readily accessible for students and scholars. And there's now also then a significant literature, both on life writing itself as a source and on various aspects of family life using life writing. I referred to Julie Mary Strange's work and um, Emma Griffin's work here too. But my strategy, I think, remains quite unusual within this um, literature in using a combination of quantitative and qualitative um, methodologies. So let's turn then to working women's life writing. And um, first thing to notice here, this is an example on the left hand side of your screen. It's by a woman who dresses as a man and volunteers in the Royal Navy. And you might think this is a bit far-fetched, but in fact, her life is actually, can be documented from other external sources. Um, she did actually receive a pension from the Navy for her, her service and um, her accounts of ship movements can be well documented, has been documented by American um, marine historians, for example. But working women's life writing is much rarer than men's. You might ask why, well, it's partly obviously to do with literary differentials, but that can't explain um, everything. Those differentials were much narrower in Britain than um, we might think. Um, it's obviously to do also with women's confidence, women's life experiences. They felt they had less interesting things to say. They weren't supported by the political movements, the institutional arrangements, the, the, the social context, which led men to think that their stories were interesting and important. Um, this creates problems for my mixed methods because it's, it means the sample sizes are very small. And um, I responded to this by trying to increase my sample size. Um, working people's autobiographies remains the backbone of the source. I've got 117 life accounts by working women, but I've added 64 life stories as told to investigators in parliamentary papers. So these are Royal Commissions investigating working life. Um, 20 accounts of relatives that appear in working people's life accounts. 14 accounts by social commentators like Mayhew and Arthur Munby who interviewed working women quite extensively. And 12 accounts extracted from working class family histories. I've tried to retain the female voice in these accounts. So this is only acceptable evidence to me if, if it's actually taken down from the woman's own mouth. Um, the life stories of women are much less systematic than men. They have many more missing values in terms of my translation of these accounts into a database. 
Um, their stories overlap with their community histories. They're disordered. They unfold episodically. It's very difficult to link them into a coherent timeline um, very often. And they seldom, unlike men, link up with, into a grand narrative. So there's no dovetailing with, for instance, battles or um, political movements or religious engagement. Um, so I would argue that these stylistic features make contextualizing events quite difficult, but they're consistent with, indeed they reflect the lives that women by and large in domestic settings with limited autonomy and little scope for purposeful action. Their life stories, you feel like they're being tossed on the stormy seas you know, of events rather than in fact directing the course of their lives. And I would argue that this is consistent with women's experience. This absence of um, directed um, unfolding of one's life. I would also argue that the women's stories are less likely to be subject to sample selection bias of you know, men who rose in the ranks of the working class. And they're more representative of the ordinary. They're um, told um, from um, the ordinary. Oops, I've missed her. Uh oh. These are some of my women. And this is one of the um, life stories that I use. This is a woman, um, Elizabeth Parker, who told her story in a sampler. Notice the domestic. Um, textile work entering in here. Um, Fabrice will enjoy this. It's not told in lace, unfortunately. It's told in, in evocative red, red blood cross stitch um, on a sampler, which is now held at the uh, Victoria and Albert uh, Museum. And it tells a story of um, her uh, emotional distress, her contemplation of suicide, but her emergence over time into a more tranquil period of her life. No man's life account would, would uh, have this um, story and no man's life account could possibly take this form. So this is a very dramatic um, illustration of the fact that we need to pay attention to the texts themselves and to the mode of presentation to understand women's lives. The families that are revealed by these stories are nuclear, they're occasionally extended, the nature of those extensions are not um, instrumental, as we might be led to believe by orthodox family history. Um, male breadwinning is already dominant in these families. The families are by and large dependent on husbands. But these husbands and fathers are frail breadwinners, as I called them in my 2010 book. They are looked to for support, but they cannot always deliver enough support for the whole family. Um, this is because of under and unemployment, because of low wages, because they die, because they're ill, because they desert their families either before or after marriage. And one um, innovation that I um, was stumbled across from reading this work is that industriousness itself separates the breadwinners from their families. Men who try very hard to provide for their families are pulled away from family life. They're working long hours. They go up away in search of better wages. And this then separates them from those for whom they are the support. And um, their breadwinner commitments fray under this stress. So ironically, it's the industriousness of this time period that in fact undermines breadwinning um, by some of these men. I also argue that reproach is more likely to creep into women's accounts than it does men's. 
And this is because women identify with their mothers because they are in fact anticipating a future role. Um, women are also more inclined than were um, the male writers to recognize mother's economic contributions, even those which were part-time, episodic, occasional. But daughters like sons were very appreciative of mother's domestic and caring work. So here's the findings on age at starting work. And you can see here the same, this is just the data taken from the men's life accounts. These are the, the results um, devote, divided into these cohorts um, for, from, the, um, from the women's uh, reminiscences. I should say here that I checked to make sure that my inclusion of things like the parliamentary papers doesn't distort this story, and it doesn't. You see the same decline in age at starting work during the crucible of the Industrial Revolution, suggesting that girls did indeed, like their brothers, share in that high participation rate from um, the Industrial Revolution. I used regression analysis to try and find what variables were correlated with age at starting work on the supply side, looking at family structure. And you can see here a very similar story for girls and boys that you've got date at starting work associated with date of birth and date of birth squared. That's just tracing out this dip in age at starting work associated with the industrial revolution. Um, the variable I want, a breadwinner, a, a, a coherent breadwinner means that children start work later, both girls and boys. You can see that's a positive coefficient. Mother's economic status is actually a sign of poverty and that reduces the age at which both girls and boys started work. But total children turns out to be differently signed, sorry, to be different for girls and boys. A large number of brothers and sisters pushed boys into the labor market at younger ages. But that's not true for girls. It's the sign is negative, but it, the variable is not statistically significant. And that's the first sign that girls and boys experiences were differentially affected by the way in which the family intersected the labor market. And I suggest that that's a result of girls' first jobs being take, the, taking care of children in their uh, families of origin. So they're very often, they, their first, in large families, their first job is to take care of children. So this summarizes what I just said. The same pressures to start work, poverty, large families, incapacitated, ab absent families, fathers, fathers who cannot be breadwinners. But also what the autobiographies told me was that there was also a serious constraint on girls' approach to the labor market as a result of their fear of sexual predation. An almost universal theme of the women's life accounts is their nervousness about um, possible threats to their, in integ their, their sexual integrity, to their reputations and so on. So here we have some examples. Um, Christian Watt, who says, well, huh, you know, fishwives were attacked both for their takings and for carnal knowledge, as she puts it. And she arms herself with a gutting knife to see off any man who would, would um, attack her. And um, what I find very distressingly in these accounts too, is that girls who grow up in the care of the state, orphaned girls or girls who are left in the workhouse, abandoned girls, that they are more likely to be subjected to sexual harassment um, and um, prey than um, girls who have family protection. And of course, this is particularly distressing because it is actually reflects the situation today. 
when we know that girls who grow up in the care of the state are also more likely to um, be the prey of paedophiles. So here's one of my autobiographers, a beautiful autobiography by a woman called Lucy Luck. And she is in fact, uh, grows up in the workhouse and she's describing here the job that is found for her by um, the, um, the, the, the workhouse authorities, the poor law authorities. And um, she's describing how the father in the family where she is lodged continuously tries, as she puts it, to ruin me, a poor orph orphan only 15 years old. And God alone kept me from falling victim to that man. So um, we, this is a, a, a good example, but there are many other examples in this genre of how these women were in fact constrained in how they sought work and how they lived their lives by fear of um, this kind of um, threat to their well-being. Turning now to schooling and again comparing the girls from the experience with the boys from my earlier work. And you can see here um, that um, girls get less schooling. This is years of schooling completed until mid-century when in fact we see a structural break, a, a leap in the num years of schooling. Um, this is associated of course with the spread of mass education and subsidies given to religious organizations to enable them um, to start providing schooling. And another leap again in for this final cohort where I've got evidence for girls, but not unfortunately for boys, where we see um, compulsion, compulsory schooling stepping in. The determinants of schooling are very similar for girls and boys. Again, they relate to the breadwinner status of the father, where he is a good breadwinner, then in fact, children get more schooling. Um, but again, let me show you that total children reduces the schooling for both boys and girls, but it's a much bigger coefficient for girls. In other words, the more siblings a child has, for a girl, that's much more likely to have a significant quantitative effect on their schooling duration. And um, similarly too, free school is much more important for girls than boys. That gives girls a significant advantage in terms of schooling duration. Um, it's positive for boys, but it's not as big and it's not what we say statistically significant. So in other words, the cost of schooling was a real constraint, a real barrier to girls' accumulation of schooling, much more than it was their brothers. There were the same strategies to maximize school attendance that I found in the sample of male autobiographies. Sunday schools are used extensively to give girls some elements of education very early starts at school um, are offered to them and so on. But girls' school attendance was much more likely to be overridden by the need for them to contribute to their families, particularly around the issues of childbirth. I haven't got time to give you the many examples um, from the autobiographies of girls who had to leave school because of the arrival of another baby in the family. Elizabeth Andrews, who we began with, she in fact describes how the arrival of a seventh or maybe it's an eighth child in the family means she has to leave school. And she's very upset about that because she enjoys school. And then she says in her autobiography, this baby died so I could return to school. I got another year of schooling. So she actually sees the death of her sister, her baby sister, as in fact an, an opportunity to go back to school for another year. But my vision of family life as a result of reading these autobiographies turns out to be very similar to that recounted by the male writers and counteracts Ginger Frost's charge that in fact 
um, if I'd used girls' accounts, I would be much less likely to see them caring closely for their mothers and less interested in their fathers. Of course, both male and female life accounts tell the story of children who, did, who had stormy, even not affectionate relationships with their mothers. And you can find this in both writings by men and women. But the vast majority of autobiographers of both sexes report love, admiration, indeed devotion for their mothers and this is in contrast to the sometimes fearful, often reserved, and occasionally downright hostile emotions expressed about fathers. Fathers are absent and distant. They're working, they're in the armed forces, they've deserted. They're very often just disinterested in their children. These were the findings from the men's life stories, and they're confirmed in the women's life accounts. Here's some quotations from the life accounts. Lucy Locke, who we accounted earlier, her autobiography, autobiography opens with her father's desertion and the family having to enter the workhouse because they, they, um, her mother is ill and cannot support the children. But even if fathers are around, they are often disinterested, distant, as you see in Edith Evans' reminiscences about her minor father. The overwhelming presence in childhood, of both girls and boys then, is the mother. And um, here again, I've got some brief quotations from the female life accounts um, where they are reflecting on the affection that they felt for their mother. And um, I've used here particular expressions of girls' um, feelings when their mothers die because this appears as a um, as a kind of structural break in the girl's life stories, that the death of the mother is treated in, with great dramatic um, interest in the women's life accounts. Um, it changes their lives once and for all. So it's not a romanticized version of mothers. Here's a picture from the time period that I'm talking about. And you see, interestingly, Lots of children here, but no men present. It's a mother and a grandmother of these children. However, Frost is right in one way, and that is that girls' closeness to their mothers was nuanced through a, a gendered um, relationship. Girls' love for their mothers and bitterness towards their fathers, I argue, had this specific gender dimension. And it's twisted through experience of childbirth, maternity, and going back to what I said earlier, this threat of sexual predation. And I'm going to try and tell this, um, the story of how maternity and fear of maternity um, through one particular example. And this is uh, the example that um, Alice uh, Moody, as she was, Alice Chase, as she becomes on marriage, um, her life story. And this is the family tree that she provides in her unpublished um, life story, which was in the Brunel archive when I accessed it. Her father, who's Reuben Moody, he marries a woman called Eleanor Busey, and you see they actually have, I think it's 13 children. So that's the row across um, here. Children of Reuben's first marriage to Eleanor. And this is a, a marriage, um, a very kind of distressing marriage because it's very um, affected by mortality. I'm going to wipe out the people who die here. So the children 
five of the children die and then Eleanor herself dies. I think this is a family where tub the, the, the tuberculosis rips through the family. And then in fact, I'm sorry, I just brought her back to life. I didn't mean to do that. The other, some of the other children die. And then Reuben marries and he marries now, not an elderly widow who can be a mother to his surviving children, but he marries a much younger woman, Priscilla Gamblin, who is a, a much younger woman. And he proceeds to have several children, as you can see, whereas Priscilla, um, oops. But Priscilla's first three babies all die. And it's only the next two who start to survive. And Alice, this is Alice who is telling the story. Now in this context of horrendous mortality, you can see that from the first generation, two girls survive, Amy and Lily. And they grow up in the family of Priscilla Gamblin, the second wife, they grow up as part of her family. And uh, Alice reflects on the fact that she loves Lily more than her own daughter. And um, that these girls are definitely taken into the family um, and cared for. But what happens is <laughs> that Priscilla herself is pregnant with, I think they're, her, they're twins actually, so she's pregnant with her seventh or eighth child at the same time that Lily is having, who's got, got married, grown up and got married, is having her third baby and Amy is having her first child. So all these three women in the family are pregnant together, very pregnant. And then Lily goes into labor, produces a child who is still born and dies within 24 hours. So the two other women of the family, not to mention these little girls who are growing up in this family, experience maternal mortality very vividly and at first hand. Priscilla, having lost her dearly beloved stepdaughter, is beside herself with grief. And um, she, get, she goes into labor while she is in fact terribly distressed. So this is a kind of experience of maternal mortality and the experience just of maternity itself. These girls, Ruby and Alice, reflect on what prospect childbirth without analgesics, um, without proper medical equip, uh, assistance might involve. So parents that are seen through this gendered lens, mothers, there's greater recognition of attempts to contribute to family incomes by girls. Girls have a fear of sexual predation that at least is recognized by mothers, much less recognized by fathers. Um, girls experience mother's hazards and the pain of child rearing, the strain of pregnancy, which boys' autobiographies, men's autobiographies, barely recognize. And the burden of children is recognized in the girl's life writing in ways that it's not recognized um, in the men's. And I'm afraid this burden of children um, is often recognized by girls because they have to look after their little siblings. And they blame their fathers for a stream of progeny, which they see as surplus to requirements and which they actually see as, as um, really the produce of the father. Fathers, meanwhile, are frail breadwinners. Very often um, girls um, really are, are, are unhappy about the quality of the breadwinning that the father provides. The, the fact that he spends money down at the pub, the fact that he is not a very generous breadwinner. But fathers are also distanced by breadwinning and they seem insensitive to maternal and sisterly burdens. Okay, so 
to finish up here, and I'm sure people have got lots of questions, I, I've not been able to go into the detail on the examples within the text that perhaps I would have liked to do. But let me say here that uh, there is an important legacy from this gendering of, the, of experience. The male autobiographers, working class men, took their experience very often into the political arena and they organized and campaigned to reform economy and society as a result of their experiences as child workers, as a result of their experiences as members of the working class. So that many of the male autobiographers, not just the famous ones, but many of the obscure ones were active in trade unionism, in uh, the struggle for the vote, in protective labor legislation, actually in abolition as well, um, the cooperative movement, the struggle for education, pensions, etc. As I said, not always on a national scale. The female autobiographers were sometimes involved in these movements, prompted by their own experiences, and we should also add here that they were often um, involved in uh, campaigns to get the votes for women as well. But their own experiences and their observations of their mothers and sisters meant that they added other specifically women's issues to the list of campaigns that they were involved with, issues that they sought to, um, to reform. So votes for women, yes, but also family allowances. Family allowances that were to be paid directly to women, not paid to men and therefore top sliced for male leisure activities before they reached their families. And they were also involved in, um, delicately enough, but in uh, issues around family size, issues around perhaps making those first delicate steps towards birth control. They were certainly involved, we've got specific examples here of Gathor and Andrews, Elizabeth Andrews, who I started off with today. Maternal care, midwifery services, services for um, pregnant women, um, services to help women um, have healthy um, surviving babies. And these <laughs> Services might seem boring and dull, like the life stories of the women who's, that I've talked about today, but they actually added very significant social uh, reform, economic reform to the men's list. And I would say that some of these reform movements have really improved the lives of working people, um, men, women and children. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to hear your questions and comments. <laughs>